Hi everyone, today I'm excited to have Anna Runkle here. She's also known as Crappy Childhood Fairy, and she makes videos on YouTube helping people figure out how PTSD affects them and what they can do about it. I love her practical and helpful advice that stems from her own personal experience and also her experience mentoring other people for the last 20 years. She is awesome. So uh, get ready to hear what she has to say. Today we're going to be talking about dysregulation, how your brain and your nervous system get dysregulated regulated when you're anxious or when um, you've experienced trauma and what to do about it. Okay, well, Anna, thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you, Emma. Just just to start off, would you mind sharing kind of the short version of your story? Is that okay? Yeah, I'll try to keep it short because interestingly, when I talk about it, I can get really dysregulated. For me, sometimes talking about hard things that happened, even now, even after I've made a career of talking about it and teaching about it, like yeah. I have to be very mindful about how I talk about it because if I just start going down the rabbit hole of terrible stories, mm -hmm. I can start losing, you know, I'll forget what room I'm in, what day it is, and that I'm actually like being recorded right now. And that's what sure. dysregulation is like. It can really be like discombobulating. So I'm 58 years old. I grew up in Berkeley, California. So that puts me being born in the 60s in the middle of a very crazy time in California. And my mom was very much part of the whole hippie, free speech, drugs thing going on. My dad was the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. And they used to fight bitterly, violently about stuff. And one, one memory I have is when I was four, we were watching Walter Cronkite and he, it was news of the Vietnam war. And I turned to my parents and I said, what is the Vietnam war? Like, what is this about <laughs> that they're mm -hmm. talking about every night? And so one of them answered, well, it's da, da, da. And then the other one said, no, it's da, da, da. And next thing you know, my dad had punched my mom and knocked her unconscious. Mm. And so that was the kind of thing that happened. Otherwise, we lived in a nice home, a nice neighborhood. My dad had his own business. Mm -hmm. But what was going on with them a lot was alcoholism. They were both alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And soon alcoholism took its toll. And we did not live in a nice house or a nice neighborhood. And mm -hmm. for most of my youth, I grew up quite poor and really neglected. And that's what alcoholism does. I have siblings. One of them died from a heroin overdose and my life ended up very populated with other people who had alcohol and drug problems. And one of the things that really helped me in my healing was when I found Al-Anon at about the age 30, age of 30. Mm -hmm. The 12 step world was incredibly helpful. It was free. It was really supportive. It was a place where I could keep talking. Now, back then I used to be in therapy like three times a week. One of the things that happened about the time when I had, became aware of my PTSD symptoms was my mom had cancer. She was in the very last couple of weeks of her life. And right about then, I got attacked randomly on the street. I got beaten <clears throat> unconscious, had my jaw broken, my teeth broken. Oh my it, was just a ra it was a random thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think what I hear from a lot of people uh, in my audience now, oops, in my audience is that sometimes childhood trauma, we get it pretty good locked up and we function, you know, some people can function really well. Not everybody can function well at every time in their life, but sometimes an adult trauma comes in and boo, it just sets the whole thing on fire. And now your PTSD symptoms are everywhere. Mm -hmm. So my mom died, I was attacked and somebody dumped me all in the same couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And it was like this perfect storm for all this suppressed childhood trauma and all the things that went with it. You know, I'm giving you the short version, but if anybody out there grew up with alcoholism, do I need to tell you, you know, there was all kinds of like risk of sexual abuse every time anybody came to the house and non-supervision. We didn't have enough food. We, nobody was minding whether we, um, you know, I never took the SAT. I didn't even know what it was to get into college, even though I was like a smart kid. So yeah. we had, we had all the classic problems of an alcoholic family, lots of fighting. But so when my childhood trauma came up, I had terrible, just terrible wounds about it all. And I had a head injury at the same time. I couldn't read. I couldn't use a phone, like just even focusing enough to use a phone. I was very, very dysregulated. But back then, they didn't, have a, they didn't know what that was. 
And so after, after the attack, I went to the doctor, they did a CAT scan. They're like, your brain is fine. It's not bleeding. Go home. And I was sitting there like, you have to help me. I can't even, like, I can't even remember how to use a key in the lock. And they're like, well, you don't have brain damage. Well, I did. I had a lifetime of brain injury from the neglect and the witnessing the violence growing up. And then what happens, as you know so well, is if you're living dysregulated, you end up with a lot of self-defeating behaviors that come up. So I would make very bizarre choices about people to hang out with, particularly boyfriends, sometimes Mm -hmm. good choices, but that's the thing about dysregulation. Right when you're in stress, it can come up and it can just like sabotage everything you're trying to do. So I just kept ending up in these self-defeating situations or I'd get a good job and then I would say something completely inappropriate when I was emotionally dysregulated. And so it was very hard for me to progress in life. In fact, I was really just sort of coming down. The closer, the older I was getting, the more it was becoming obvious something was really wrong. So I was going to a therapist three times a week. She's like, let's talk about it. Let's, you know, tell me what happened. Tell me about the assault again. Tell me this. Tell me what your parents did. Because that's what you're supposed to do, or you were then. That was their best understanding of what to do. Yeah. But every time I talked about it, I would just go into this deep dysregulation where I couldn't feel my hands, my face would go numb. Mm-hmm. And it was almost like I was I was people pleasing to try to like keep talking and say the things you're supposed to say out of this act of faith that if I just keep talking, I will feel better one of these years. But I wasn't. I was feeling worse. And soon I was feeling so bad that I was hiding from the therapist how bad it was because I was afraid she was going to have me locked up for being at risk of harming myself. And that's a bad place to be. (laughs) Right. And then a miracle happened. A miracle happened at that point, the night when I was losing hope. I had sort of like burned up my last friendship with my constant drama and neediness from people, very self-centered. You know, that's what it's like to be in trauma and dysregulated. It's very hard to pay attention to other people. I always say it's like having headphones blasting heavy metal in your ears and you're sitting there trying to pretend to have a conversation as if that's not happening. Mm -hmm. So this woman came along she was an acquaintance. We had a theater group. I gave her a ride home. And for some reason, I decided to tell her, I said, I feel like I can't live anymore. Mm-hmm. And I don't know why I knew she was a safe person to tell. And she just said, here, come on in. Let's have a cup of tea. I have totally felt that way. And she told me the story of she she was an alcoholic from the time she was 12, the first time she tasted alcohol. I'm not an alcoholic. There's no explanation for why I act like one sometimes, <laughs> but it's dysregulation. <laughs> but she told me her story. She got really into drinking. And by the time she was 17, she couldn't even keep alcohol down. And so she had to go to AA and she got sober in AA, but she was sober and suicidally depressed. Mm-hmm. And then her miracle happened and she met somebody who showed her how to begin to do this writing exercise of writing fears and resentments. It was the way she taught it to me. It was as a prayer, very 12 steppy. You write your fears and resentments. You ask God to remove them. Well, at the time I, you know, God, eh, you know, <laughs> I had this, yeah. I, I had this real um, bad attitude towards spiritual religious people. I had what I thought was a socially acceptable view on this. Like, I think there's something out there, but I didn't really think there was a power that could help me. But she said, well, it seems like you might be about to die. So you, how would you feel about just pretending there's a God and asking God to help you? (laughs) I thought, well, why not? And so I tried the techniques and this took place over a couple of weeks where I was trying it. And then I got to read it to her and I experimented with this prayer. I had a couple of very experimental prayers. One was, if you're real, prove it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> How'd that go? <laughs> I recovered. Like within two mm-hmm. weeks, I could read, I could use a phone, and I didn't want to die. Wow. And there yeah. it was. And not only that, I started to have these very strong feelings of coming back to life, kind of. There was this feeling that, like I used to be a heavy smoker at that time, two packs a day for years. I was a real heavy smoker. That's how I was self-regulating and handling my my emotions. Yeah. And I, I didn't end up giving it up for a few years. A few years into all of this, I was able to be healed of that. But but I used to smoke heavily. And so my lungs were always completely messed up. I was always coughing. And, <laughs> and I had this distinct feeling that the cells in my lungs were just being like remade and rehealed and made pink again. And 
And then I started to feel that like all through my body. And I, I wouldn't really swear by that being a literal thing that was happening, but that was my experience. I just felt like I was just getting this new life running through me. And I started spending time in nature and I started running and I kind of stopped smoking, not really, but, you know, little, little bits of progress at a time. Yeah. It was years before I solved some of my other problems. But the first problem that was solved was this feeling that I didn't deserve to be on earth, that nobody wanted me here and that I was too damaged to stay another day. And mm. I just had a profound experience of, of being real and wanted and belonging to everything that's alive. And that right there became my new, my new floor. You know, I never went below that. It's like, no, I belong here. Like life may be hard today and I've made horrible mistakes and I'm ashamed, but I belong here. Mm -hmm. And I want to stay, I want to stay alive. So that was, that was a profound change for me. And that's really when I mark the healing happening for me. That's awesome. That's so cool. Thank you for sharing your story and your vulnerability. I appreciate that let's just pause for a second are you i should have asked you before i asked you to share that are you doing are you okay yeah yeah you can count on me i won't go where i can't go okay cool well thank you thank you that's that's yeah incredible story i was soon sponsoring and i think i sponsored something like 300 women that's and, so cool. Yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> I learned a lot. I mean, I, yeah. I, I just learned so much about how to be a supportive person and how to help somebody grasp an idea and how to deal with conflict. And, and it's been positive and I still sponsor a person or two, but mostly now I've taken, I've taken my message. I took it out of the 12 step arena because what I'm teaching, um, is for CPTSD. I mm-hmm. realized this was a turning point for me. And I, it, while it's a hundred percent true, my parents were alcoholic. My brother was an alcoholic and a heroin addict. There's more alcoholism in my family. I'm very, very affected by it or was my core problem is not that anymore. Like it was, and I had so much to share about it. And it was so helpful to learn the al ideas and to learn to detach and to get the focus on myself. And once I really had the focus on myself, I realized that I had something that was a hundred percent me. And it wasn't alcoholism. I used to say, oh, I think there must be a kind of alcoholism that doesn't involve drinking. Mm -hmm. But then Bessel van der Kolk's book came out and Pete Walker's book came out, The Body Mm -hmm. Keeps the Score and CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving. And when I heard the description of what is CPTSD, I was just like, oh my God, (laughs) that is what I have. It's not alcoholism Mm -hmm. without drinking. Like that was the best construct I had. Yeah. It's complex PTSD and I'm a textbook case. And that day was such a relief. (laughs) It was such a relief because as much as I had like 20 whatever years of Al-Anon and felt good about all that, like I never really got that the strange way that I behave when I'm dysregulated, the, the emotional overreactions, the discombobulation, the having to fake it through situations when I'm so flustered and that I feel like I have headphones on. Yeah. There's a word for that and it's a thing and I didn't cause it and it's normal. It's a normal reaction to an abnormal set of circumstances. And it just allowed like this huge wave of forgiveness of myself as well as the people who hurt me. Just like, okay, we all have this like pattern. We have it. And the fact that I, well, like I want to say this differently. I don't know why I'm the one who got to heal and didn't get killed by it. But the fact that I have survived is such a miracle that I can only have wonder and awe and gratitude at it. And when when something so wonderful happens, a natural consequence is that you want to get up on the rooftop and just go, everyone. And (laughs) sometimes people have said, could you shut up with your yammering about CPTSD? And I'm like, look, if I had a cure for cancer, would you blame me? (laughs) If I just wanted to talk about it all the time, because I have something that big, you know, complex PTSD causes cancer. There's an extremely (laughs) elevated risk of cancer for people who had childhood trauma, also heart disease, you know, high blood pressure, depression, learning disabilities, dementia, reproductive disorders. It affects every part of our lives. And it yeah. really, the part that people don't talk about enough is it is how it impacts our partner relationships, our marriages and romantic relationships. And when that goes badly, 
it then sends it right into the next generation. So, so I just felt like if, the, you know, I just want to talk about this. I don't even know what I'm doing. I you know, I was like out of the gate, but uh, my, my life had brought me to that point where I had the knowledge and the experience come together one day and I had a mm -hmm. word for it. And I had been feeling this desire ever since I was in Al-Anon, like, I feel like I should write a book or I should something about this. And when I had the word for it, then my crappy childhood fairy thing was born. It started as a blog so and, cool. and it found an audience and I never expected it to be like what it is or to be here talking to you today, but it's completely taken over my, my career. I change careers now. This is what I do. And what a joy it is to wake up every day, like excited. Cause I feel like, I feel like I can do something helpful. Yeah. You've got something to share and people who want to hear it because it helps them. Yeah. So I know cool. you know how it is. Yeah, <laughs> I do. And I love it. And I do. Yeah. What a gift. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more about dysregulation. You keep mentioning it and you've alluded to it. Tell us what is dysregulation and where does it come from? Well, so I'm not a scientist. I'm not a clinician. I read some books and mm -hmm. I read articles about it. And I first learned about it, I think, from Pete Walker and Bessel van der Kolk. I had read other literature about trauma, but other trauma, various books and authors focus on different aspects of it. But dysregulation is the thing that unlocked healing for me. So as I've come to understand it, what it is, is everybody gets dysregulated sometimes. You, you yeah. might recognize the feeling as just being flustered, overwhelmed, just feeling like to me, it also, it's, it doesn't just feel like I have headphones on. Sometimes it feels like my hair is in my eyes and I'm just like, <laughs> yes, yes. yes. Like, like overstimulated. Yeah. Like, like every yeah. sound and noise is overwhelming because your brain can't process stuff. Right. right? right. Yeah. Like you can't think because there's too much like, yeah dinging going on around you. Yeah. 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 And when you don't know what it is, there's a lot of self-attack and hiding and shame and control. And also when it's happening, like it's very hard to, your perception is wrong. So everybody else's advice, like follow your heart, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. When you're dysregulated, that's not good advice actually, because when I'm dysregulated and someone hurts my feelings, my heart says, tell them the worst thing you can think to say, destroy this friendship, run away. You know, it's just bad information. So once you are able to identify when you're dysregulated, it gives you a real opportunity to use that pause. We all talk about between the impulse and the action. Like when I want to say something mm -hmm. hurtful, if I know I'm dysregulated, I have a rule like, don't say it. It never comes to anything good. Yeah. And I teach people like, don't drive when you're dysregulated. Don't mm -hmm. um, try to have an important conversation when you're dysregulated. Like your thinking is off. It's not the same as being drunk, but it's something like that. You're not yourself. You're seeing yeah. things differently. And so for me, the cues that I'm dysregulated, it's not always obvious right away. One of the really easy ones is I start to feel numb in my nose. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. Yeah. I start to go numb. Then my whole hands go numb. I can't really feel them. And it's really hard for me to hold a pen. That's been going on all my life. And I just thought it was a quirk of being Anna, but it's dysregulation. And what's going on is um, our brains are generating waves and they have kind of a lovely pattern. Like you might see the lines of a river flowing together. And in dysregulation, they're, they're like, if you were to measure them and you had a scan and you could see what they're doing, they're literally kind of just going out of, nah, they're getting zigzaggy and not in sync and they're going at the wrong time. And then also heart rate variability your heart and respiration, what they are meant to do is I take a breath in and my heart will speed up a little bit. I exhale and it slows down slightly. And those things are going in sync. And what I learned from my reading is that those things go out of sync. When a person yeah. with past trauma feels triggered or stre intensely stressed, they go out of sync. Now, does it matter to me consciously if my heart and breathing are kind of ragged? I didn't think so, but it turns out experts think <laughs> that it's in that dysregulation is where a lot of the sort of like immune function lapses happen. Your body can't fight what's happening with viruses or wounds. And that, a lot of my symptoms before I healed, I had a lot of stress related things and I knew they were stress related and the doctors would write me off and say, Oh, it's just stress. Go do stress. Like it wasn't helpful. Yeah. 
but I had yeah. asthma, I had back pain, I had knee, all kinds of like strange pain, migraines. And yeah. when I get stressed out, I still get visited by those things. But now I kind of know I've been practicing now for a long time. Like I somaticize, it goes into my body and I can kind of work it back out of my body. And mm -hmm. I've found some really helpful resources for doing that. So that's part of it. Also, this daily writing practice, I follow it with meditation. And those two things together made a big difference in me being able to tune into my body at least twice a day and be like, oh, I'm actually really tired or I'm mm -hmm. hungry or I need to get outside. I'm craving sunshine or I'm craving oranges or, you know, my body can start like having a little time with me <laughs> instead of yeah. me just like overriding every impulse. So that's part of it. But dysregulation so I've touched on the health consequences of it and it's not totally understood, but dysregulation does go downstream and probably trauma is one of the single, if not the single biggest causes of terrible chronic health problems there is. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff people aren't talking about it about yet. Like the number of unintended pregnancies a person experiences is closely correlated with the intensity of trauma they had growing up. Mm-hmm. Nobody's talking about that. A lot of things, people have their very comfortable way of viewing, like, why do people get pregnant, you know, on right. accident? And everybody has their little story. Oh, they just want a baby to love. Or, oh, it's the political party I don't like, you know, and what they said and did. And I think, I think by and large, trauma is driving a great deal of it. I mean, well, and, yeah. yeah, totally. I, I, I think so too. And I think people aren't addressing this in a way that's super helpful because they maybe don't understand. And it, most people don't know about this. Like you were looking for help for years and mm -hmm. kind of the old way of doing therapy was you, we just talk about a problem over and over and over again and hope that that desensitizes us. Mm -hmm. But instead it, for many people that makes them more upset and it reinforces that trauma response in your body. <laughs> and yeah, as, as the experience of abuse or the experience of neglect creates a nervous system response that can get stuck, right? Like this, <laughs> this sympathetic response, this fight, flight, freeze response. And you mentioned it like with your friends, right? When you're dysregulated, you will attack someone. And that's like the fight, flight, freeze response, right? You're going to mm -hmm. fight or you're going to push someone away to mm -hmm. protect yourself. And this is all part of this like kind of trapped nervous system response to the danger that your body perceived or was real, the very real danger you experienced as, as a child, right? Yeah. And, and I've come to respect it and, and love it for that. I love my, <laughs> I love my CPTSD because it saved me. It yeah. saved me from a lot of stuff I couldn't face as a child. And it kind of left me intact and innocent. And that's what I've sort of uncovered through healing is there is a completely good and innocent person inside. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true for everyone. Oh, that's such a beautiful way to frame it because people don't understand that these these weird reactions we have with PTSD actually serve a function. Like your body's trying mm -hmm. to protect you. Your brain, your deep wisdom is trying mm -hmm. to keep you safe or trying to help you survive something that seems life-threatening or is life-threatening. Right? Yeah. I, I have a funny word for it. I call it crap fit. We learned it, to you fit. call it what? Crap fit. Crap. C R A P. Because I'm the crappy childhood fairy. Yeah, yeah. Crap fit is fitting yourself to crap. And as a kid, you learn it's like, it's like, you know, you know, mom brought home a terrible boyfriend who I'm scared of. No problem. I'll be tough as nails. I may be six years old, but I can fight and I'll have like a piece of wood under my bed and I'll figure things out and I'll handle this. I can handle this. You look back yeah. and it's kind of crazy. But that part of us actually allowed us to handle it and not internalize it and not, you know, just wither up and die out of neglect. And then it shows up again in adulthood and it's completely dysfunctional. So right. that's one of the messages I'm always giving people. It's like, oh, God bless you for going into denial. Thank God you were able to go into not denial about things because it's, it's something like a medically induced coma. You know how they do that to people who have had a terrible like physical trauma? They'll yeah. just like put them into a coma so that there's like no energy required for them to just heal. And I think that's what some of the adaptations, the maladaptations of complex PTSD are, is it's self-protection. And then we go through a lot of hardship, usually in the late teens, early 20s, you know, maybe on and on and on. But there comes a day when you have the information and you can go, oh, 
That's what saved me. Now I need to learn the new adaptation, which is to stop being in denial so that when somebody comes along and asks me out, but it turns out they're a heroin addict, not, not naming any names of who's done that. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> I need mm -hmm. to be able to see that something's wrong with this picture. Yeah. And I didn't have that. So that was a consequence of my trauma. And even after a lot of healing, I had this, these incredible blind spots and a really hard time discerning who is a good person in my life. When, when I have a conflict, how much of that was my fault? I would always be a hundred percent confused about that and toggle between it's all their fault. No, it's all my fault. No, it's all their fault. Yeah. If you have the power of discernment to kind of work that through and see you have the world is your oyster. Now you're on a level playing field. Like that's what all the normal kids had is they had a way to think through life's conflicts and figure out what to do and, and not just self-sabotage and burn all their bridges and run away. You know, that's a very mm -hmm. that's a sad way of dealing with it. So a lot of what I teach people, I teach them first to re-regulate and then to start solving the life problems that developed in dysregulation. Yeah. And it's this painful, joyous process to start experiencing that. And there's no way to learn it except to like live your life, get into a pickle, <laughs> get support from your buddies, you know, in the program mm -hmm. I teach, I get, I help people get connected with people and then continue to keep processing emotions, you know, which you also know the importance of to keep processing the emotions that come up. Because with PTSD, they come up so strongly that the impulse is there to just give up, just yeah. blow everything up. But you hang in there, you hang in there and you have a tool to keep like, there's an exit route. What happens to people like me is there's a lot of either complete overt avoidance of people or what I call covert avoidance, where people act all extroverted and friendly and have a job and a marriage or whatever, but they, but they never really give themselves to anything. They're never really yeah. present. And it's just something they haven't been able to manage yet. And it ends up hollowing out life and making it empty. And some of the symptoms are your friends don't really get you and they don't even match you because you've never really been yourself in their presence so that they could decide that you're not for them either. And it's this, it's this big false life that is one of the more successful looking outcomes of having trauma. But a lot of the people who come to me, some of them are, you know, they're having more obvious overt problems that you would associate. I'm depressed, you know, I'm in an abusive relationship. That's common. But some of it is I'm just empty. And I find myself pulling away from people all the time. And I hate it when I get invited to something. And all I want to do is think of how I can get out of it. And it's not necessarily the same as introversion. It's that people are just so triggering. And the fear that if we get triggered, we're going to say something damaging becomes crippling. It just holds you back. So, yeah. so healing in my view involves a combination of learning to process those emotions, so, pooping them out so that they're, they don't have the better of you. They're not like holding you down all the time or have you at the edge of rage. You, you have something to do with rage short of expressing it. And, and that's one of the challenges for it too. One of the things I wanted to say about dysregulation. Yeah is the emotional dysregulation, which is kind of part of neurological dysregulation, but also its own thing. And it's widely recognized as part of other things like, like borderline personality disorder, emotional dysregulation. And I just, I had started out by saying like, everybody gets dysregulated sometimes and, and almost everybody eventually re-regulates. And my prototype for what that looks like is a newborn baby. I have two sons, they're big now, but when they were little, I would hold that they, I would come to them when they were crying and they'd be going, Aah! their bodies were rigid and their faces were red and they were completely flipped out. <laughs> and yeah. I would hold them and maybe feed them and let them be held and comforted. And very quickly they would just come back into focus and they'd open their little eyes and smile at me and they would be completely transformed. And we know yeah. what that is, is co-regulation. Mm -hmm. So everybody gets dysregulated. Sometimes I just think people with trauma get dysregulated a little more than the average Joe and more often, and maybe has a harder time coming back from it. So, so much depends on learning to master re-regulation and it can be learned. It can be learned. Yeah. Let's talk about that. So you get mm. dysregulated, you recognize it, right? You might be acting funny or thinking in like unclear ways or not thinking well at all, or you might feel like those physical symptoms in your body, or you might just know like something's off or you feel numb or you feel buzzy or whatever, overstimulated, mm -hmm. learning to self-regulate or re-regulate. How do you learn this? How do you learn this skill? 
Well, yeah. First step, you've got to learn to catch it when it's happening. And, and I say that like so harshly, but that's, it can, you can learn to catch it when it's happening. So I talked about some of the physical symptoms that it's going on. Sometimes it's a thought. I have a couple of thoughts that I just always take. I just always go on the assumption if I'm having this thought, I'm dysregulated. And one of the thoughts is I don't need you. I don't need anybody. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm in it now. <laughs> Here we go. That's like a really functional thought for a six-year-old in an alcoholic family, yes. but not for someone who's like, you know, trying to have consistent friendships and relationships. Yeah. Or marriage, right? you know, I don't need yeah, you marriage. every time there's an argument. I don't need you. I don't need anybody. So if I'm thinking that thought, the other mm -hmm. one, and this is one that often comes with emotional flashbacks and emotional flashbacks is one of the best phrases I ever learned. I learned that from Pete Walker's book. But yeah. that's, that's an emotional memory that comes up. You don't even know you're in a memory, but it's driving you to see things in a bad way. And so sometimes I wake up, this happened to me the other day. I wake up in a very bad mood. That's what I used to call it. But actually I'm in an emotional flashback. And I, before I've even opened my eyes, I'm laying in bed going, I have to do everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I know all parents feel like that sometimes. <laughs> all spouses feel that way. But I get it to this wrong. I'm, I have this distorted, exaggerated feeling that nobody will help me and I have to do everything. And again, it's clearly an adap adaptive thought, but it's a maladaptation now. And it yeah. causes me to be very difficult to deal with. My husband mm. can now see it a mile off. He can see it as <laughs> soon as I open my, you know, he can feel the energy like rising off of me, the, 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 the stink, right? <laughs> the yeah. stink of dysregulation. And he just sort of says, would you like coffee? And then he leaves the room <laughs> and he leaves me. Like you it. need a minute. Like you need a minute. Honey. You need a minute. <laughs> and you're like, no, I don't. No, I don't. And then no, I you don't. take a second. No, I don't. <laughs> I need to tell you. So that's another sign. This another is, thought. This is about you. Yeah. yeah this is about you. And it's urgent that I tell you mm -hmm. everything right now that you're doing wrong. That sense of urgency. I always tell people, if you think it's urgent, go to halftime, just slow down, take a break. If it's yeah. urgent that you give somebody a criticism, it's probably your dysregulation talking. Anything yeah. that needs to be said or fixed in your relationship, you can do it in an hour or tomorrow <laughs> and it'll be okay. And that well, takes like a that. huge, yeah, huge amount of self-restraint to just like, okay, hold on. I'm not going to do anything about this right now. I'm furious. I can hardly yeah. stand it another minute, but instead I take it here. I carry paper with me everywhere, you know, just in case it happens. And I do this twice a day anyway. And I begin to write my fears. I am resentful at my husband because I have fear. He won't help me and fear I have to do everything. That's how my prayer begins. You know, I'm just admitting like I have this. I don't have to do anything about it. I don't have to understand it. I don't even have to communicate it. I write it. I write a thing at the end where I ask for it to be removed. And then I rest in meditation. And nine times out of 10, I can't even remember that there was an issue. It's past. Yeah. Sometimes there's stuff we got to talk about though. And with less of that thing going on in my head, it's possible yeah. for me to have that conversation. It doesn't happen 100% of the time cleanly, but now I actually have a chance to have a conversation in a good way that, that gets heard, that somebody yeah. cares to respond and, and it doesn't end up turning into a big argument. If I have an argument, I'm going to be dysregulated for three days. So I have a huge incentive to try to solve things peacefully. Yeah. Okay. So for the listener out there, the first step is to come to know your own signs of dysregulation. And you just shared a couple awesome examples. So that might be a consistent thought you have. It might be something you feel in your body. It might be just an emotional sense. And maybe for the listener, I mean, I would recommend as a therapist, people write down their red flag signs. Like what? Like I'm like tape this to your wall. Like if I'm feeling this, it might be dysregulated. If I'm thinking this, I might be dysregulated. Tape that to your wall, right? Or what do you tell people? Well, I love taping it to your wall. That's an excellent suggestion. I, that's more reliable than just remembering it because your memory is altered too when you're dysregulated. Yeah. And then you say, slow it down. So decrease the urgency to act on that. Like, oh, if this is a problem in the relationship, we can mm -hmm. talk about it in an yeah. hour or when I'm calm. Yeah. And you, and you use writing to slow yourself down, I like do. to just like process through things. Yeah. It helps also to just tell yourself, I'm really dysregulated right now. Oh, I'm mm -hmm. dysregulated right now to actually like say it to yourself. Mm -hmm. Just acknowledging it starts to then give you this part of yourself that is aware of the situation and isn't just getting carried downstream in wild waters. 
and drowning yeah. in it. You Part of you is kind of going, okay, I'm still kind of drowning in this river, but I see what's happening. I'm dysregulated. And that's where you begin to have the option of a pause. Yeah. And you can even tell, you can tell people who it's affecting. You can say, I'm feeling dysregulated right now. Yep. And you can also help them tremendously because in dysregulation, we can be very aggressive or abandoning. And now, now you're giving somebody else CPTSD. So instead, instead you can say, I'm feeling really dysregulated right now. Would it be okay if I took a break to get my head together? And then we could come back and keep talking about this, say uh, a quarter after the hour, would that work? And they say yes. And then show up and then show up and you, you can get tremendous cooperation from a partner or friend. If you can communicate what's happening, don't blame them, take care of it and make a date to come back as soon as possible because they're in the yes. middle of needing to work out something that just happened. Yeah. Yes. I love it. I love it. So what else can people do? So they, the pause is really important and then come back to the problem. Is there anything else you mentioned specifically writing, mm -hmm. pausing, mm -hmm. meditation, and like a prayer, like, may this be removed from me? Mm -hmm. Is that some of your basic steps to get re-regulated? Is there something else you'd add to that? Yes. Yeah, so I have, I'll tell you some emergency steps to re-regulate. Mm -hmm. And then I have a free course. If anybody wants to learn the writing technique, I can share the link with you to share. Yeah. And awesome. I'll put that in the description. You can, learn, you can learn and try it in less than an hour and just see, does it feel helpful to you? And if you like it, I do free Zoom calls every couple of weeks and you can come ask questions and we do use the techniques together. And so that's where everything I teach begins. You, you learn this technique, but in a pinch, well, first of all, I do carry this with me everywhere. And whether I'm in a business meeting or a party and I have to walk into the bathroom, here we are back in the bathroom. I just keep going there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the bathroom is a private place where you can write if you want, when you're having a freak out in a social situation. So you can just yeah. come back, just come back into yourself and get free of it so you can come back out and handle it more the way you choose to handle it. Um, which, by the way, isn't always being Mr. Nice Girl. <laughs> it's <laughs> Right. Yeah. It, this is not like fostering avoidance and just suppressing and ignoring emotions. No. It's like clarity, right? Yeah, clarity. And sometimes you need to tell people, don't ever put your hands on me again. And you yeah. can't do that until you've written because you're too jammed up with it. But the emergency measures are basically just nervous system techniques to just get back in your body. And people used to say, I'm out of my body. That I didn't used to understand what they were saying. But what they're talking about is my nervous system is not communicating awareness of every part of my body right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. so you can bring yourself back by just sitting in a chair, just like I sit down really hard in a chair and then I just feel my weight in the chair. I feel my feet on the floor. And a lot of therapists have helped people with this. They will remind you, come back, sit down, you can press your tongue to the back of your teeth. It's mm. just giving yourself physical sensations. And then, then it's left and right. We now know, like, there must have been PTSD for thousands of years, forever, right? How did they deal with it? Well, who has PTSD? Soldiers, for example, what did they do? They march in formation and say, left, right, left, right. And everybody oh, yeah. does goes together. And calling out, hearing left, right, and moving left, right, like you would in a Zumba class or in marching or in martial arts, hearing it and doing it is very re-regulating. It just helps you kind of pull it back together. And doing it in a group for reasons nobody understands, but when we do this in a group, it amplifies the benefit. Yeah, there's and there's brain about, science. There's brain science behind this showing that it's helping your brain like cross the two hemispheres and re-regulate. I mean, there's a lot of good science behind this, and I appreciate you teaching this in a practical and understandable way. And if anyone wants to read Bessel van der Kolk's book or uh, Francine Shapiro's book, I mean, they're like 400 pages long, <laughs> you know, but they have these techniques. But basically what you're doing is like teaching this on a very practical level. Yeah, and for people with PTSD, reading a book is often out of the question. Oh, Reading right. A paragraph yeah. It's hard to do. You're hard going to process, over, and over can be triggering. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, okay. That's great. So some left, right movements, some like patting yeah. your feet, patting your legs, yeah. getting in Super contact true. again with your body. Right? Contact. Sometimes I just then, touch my face. You okay. know, there's this, this soccer player, Lionel Messi, who's like the mm -hmm. hero of soccer. You know who he is? Uh -huh. He is constantly stroking his face during stressful games. Oh. And I was like, that is self-soothing. That is what that oh. is. <laughs> oh, I'd be terrified if I were a soccer player. I would just, I would just be frozen up on the field. 
Yeah. Another one is temperature. You can use like hot water, cold water to oh, yeah. just give yourself a little sort of nervous system. Hello, shock. And yeah. I like Wim Hof methods, the, the he- intense breathing and cold showers. Mm-hmm. I find them incredibly like a real shortcut to re-regulation. I took a cold shower this morning. I've been really on my cold showers lately because I had a, a dysregulating event a few days ago and it's taken me a while to come back. And so that's one thing I do. I lose track of time when I'm dysregulated. And so I try to have a really strong morning routine. So that's a morning routine is, I think, one of the foundational things is to just get started with one, two or three things that help you to to kind of get your brain centered again and be ready, be ready to pay attention. But also washing hands with warm water. That's very usually you can get to a bathroom sink and wash your hand with back in the bathroom emma yeah <laughs> well, it's, a, it's a place you can have a little privacy and have a moment right yeah. whereas if you're out in public it's just yeah. too sensory overwhelm at least for me sometimes yeah, yeah. So. so washing yeah. your hands nobody knows you're re-regulating it just looks like a yeah. good positive thing to do and the warm <laughs> yeah. water and the soap and just feeling your hands and going these are my hands here i am and mm-hmm. next thing you know you're back and finally a hug and hugs are tricky because Sometimes when you're in a bad place, you don't want to be hugged or touched. That's okay. And this is something for friends and couples is you can say, do you want to hug right now when you see somebody's dysregulated? But if you can't handle being hugged or there's no one to hug you, you can back into a corner and squish yourself in there. And yeah. I learned that from Temple Grandin and her, her technique for getting into a swing and twisting yourself around to squeeze yourself. I'm like, yes. That does feel good. Yeah, I've seen that with quite a few clients, like in residential treatment, when they're really stressed out, they'll just, well, yeah, I mean, but you can think about this as a child, right? You wrap in a blanket, snuggle yeah. on a couch, press into your stuffed animals, squeeze yeah. into your bed. Like these are safety, right? This is like yeah. restoring your sense of safety. Yeah. I tried a weighted blanket, but it, it was heavy. I didn't like yeah. it. <laughs> Some people yeah. really love them though. <laughs> you know, you just got to find yeah. what soothes you, right? Isn't it wonderful though? Like so much of what we thought was like some sort of psychological crazy aspect of ourselves. It's like, no, it's just your left, right hemispheres need to be talking to each other again and you need some, some weight on you. (laughs) It's okay. Yeah. (laughs) There's nothing, you know, you're not doing anything wrong. I mean, how many times do people go, I think you just want to recreate your childhood or, you know, I'd be like, I don't, I really don't think so. (laughs) No. (laughs) <laughs> and, it's, and I think there's two ways of looking at this, right? Like, like you're saying, like some people look at this and like, this is pathological. You must be broken. Yeah. And the other way of looking at this is your nervous system has an inherent ability to heal. Yeah. Your nervous system has an inherent ability to reset. Mm-hmm. And if you listen to it, it will guide you to mm-hmm. re-regulate yourself. Yeah. It wants to reset just like your skin yeah. wants to yeah. form a scab and then heal over. You're designed yeah. to heal. And you got to kind of get out of the way sometimes and and like let that natural process happen. But it's hard. It's hard with a head full of competing ideas about how to do it. So, yeah. Well, that's awesome. I find this so helpful. Thank you so much for taking time to share your wisdom and experience with my audience. Really love it. Thanks. Oh, we're going to have to talk again. I I want you to talk to my audience. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Yes. And for those of you out there, I am going to be talking with Anna again. So please Mm -hmm. check out her channel. She's got tons of great resources. Even just talking with you today, I'm like, oh, I can think of three clients right now who I'm sending a link to your channel to. (laughs) So yeah, keep an eye out for that. And for those of you who want to hear the full length conversation, I've cut some of it down for this video. If you want to hear the full length conversation, go check it out on my podcast. Okay, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Anna, for being here. And we'll talk to you uh, later. Bye. Bye.